Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Binance Podcast. My name is Wee Zhou. I'm the host for this show. In my daytime job, I'm the chief financial officer for Binance. I joined Binance from the traditional financial world, where I served as the chief financial officer for several Chinese and American companies, two of which were listed on NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. Since I've joined Binance, I basically have witnessed a lot more people who are becoming more and more interested in blockchain and cryptocurrency. So what I want to do with this show is to spend time talking to specialists, entrepreneurs, scholars, influencers, basically leading people from a variety of industries. Hopefully through these conversations, we can share insights on how blockchain is changing not just these different industries, but also in changing the world. Here's a quick disclaimer. All opinions expressed by our hosts and our guests on this podcast are merely their own opinions. They do not imply any endorsements or opinions of their companies. You should not take these opinions as specific investment advice, as you will be solely responsible for your own investment. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the Binance Podcast. We're recording an emergency pod here to take a look at what I think is the most important uh, event for cryptocurrency in 2019, which is the uh, long anticipated uh, entry by Facebook into cryptocurrency. I'm here to basically go over a report that was put out post release of the white paper for Libra by Binance's uh, research department. And I'm really, 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 really excited because I think I've mentioned the Facebook coin and the JP Morgan coin in our very first uh, podcast. And then uh, I've also made some public comments about how it may be a walled off garden. But I think some of those facts have been confirmed. Some of those discussions and ideas have been uh, negated and it's not a walled off garden. And it's actually something that we are very, very excited about here at Binance. And then uh, especially myself, have been very impressed by the thoughtfulness as well as the potential and the uh, mainstream adoption that's all going to be taken over by this release from Facebook. First of all, some of the high level takeaways, Libra is the name of the cryptocurrency, and that is going to be minted on the Libra network. And the Libra network is a blockchain developed by a Swiss foundation and a consortium, which is being led by Facebook. Secondly, from the white paper, the cryptocurrency itself is going to be backed by a basket of financial assets. I think in its initial release for 2020, the four denominated fiat currencies that's backing it are US dollar, euros, Japanese yen, and British pound. Third big sort of highlight is that it's actually going to be running as a proof of stake blockchain with a two token system. And this infrastructure relies on the uh, Byzantine fault tolerant consensus algorithm and will support smart contracts after it transitions from a permission state, which it will be at the beginning, to a permissionless environment later. These other things we've already seen before in the previous crypto ecosystem, but the biggest impact is that within the next year and a half, 18 months, Libra is going to be incorporated into the Facebook ecosystem, into Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Facebook.com, as well as potentially Instagram as well. And that is actually going to be used within the Calibra wallet interface, which was released concurrently at Calibra.com. And from the interface of it, it looks really sleek. And they've already integrated, looks like, uh, into Messenger, uh, Facebook Messenger. This is a over 2.4 billion user base around the world. So mass adoption from day one onto the existing Facebook ecosystem. My imagination has gone crazy go over sort of the potential of it. But I think let's go over some of the basic detailed overviews before we talk about the medium and term impact, the long term impact, both financially, economically, globally, geopolitically, because uh, initial feedback from a lot of the politicians around the world have been very negative against this project. But I think once you dig in and you think about the underlying thesis of Bitcoin, the original cryptocurrencies in terms of a freedom of money in a decentralized world, I think this gets us much closer to that end goal. According to the white paper, what is Libra? Libra is backed by a not-for-profit organization that is domiciled in Switzerland, and it's called the Libra Association, and that will serve two main functions. First is that it will govern and oversee the Libra network, and second of all, it will manage the reserves that keeps the value of Libra backed by uh, real-world assets. So the Libra itself is backed by what we call the Libra Reserve, and that's going to consist of a basket of low-volatility assets, structured to keep uh, the value relatively stable. But from the design, Libra is not designed to be a stable coin, as is defined in the current real world, because it is not 
pegged to a single fiat currency. I think specifically, Libra left itself a lot of room for changes because it basically said initially baskets, USD, British pound, euros, and Japanese yen, but it lists out some of the criterias for uh, future assets to be added or eligible for long-term inclusion into the Libra's reserve. Some of the, the conditions are it needs to be individually uncorrelated, right? So only fiat currencies with free float are available. Currencies that are pegged uh, or tied to or semi-pegged will be redundant. Second of all, the decision-making process should be tied to either a public organization or the asset is freely accessible, like organizations such as basically central bank or commodities. And the third most importantly is that is quotability, that the asset uh, must be universally recognized across jurisdictions. What that means is that if an Apple share is only traded with US dollar, that is a single jurisdiction. So it lacks additional quotes, whereas alternatives like gold or Bitcoin, which has multiple quoting in different jurisdictions, are much better. So I do think that ultimately down the road, Bitcoin, as well as other type of alternative assets, may very well be added to this basket. That's sort of the high level um, parameters. I think another one is we want to take a look at is the technical parameters. First of all, the consensus algorithm that is built is a proof of uh, stake algorithm where nodes are run by a consortium participants that are widely dispersed geographically with relatively high technical requirements. So initially, there's about 27 or 30 organizations that are part of this. But I think one of the key things that is very different about the Libra network is actually it's intentionally developed by uh, Facebook and its consortium as a public blockchain, which is the opposite of a private blockchain, which is sort of what the JP Morgan quorum blockchain is. What that has allowed is the Libra tokens will be tradable on exchanges. And we do anticipate to list it on Binance as a result. The smart contract language that they've used, Move, M-O-V-E, um, which is a programming language that is built for the Libra blockchain. In addition to the existing consortium members, they have come out and said that they're going to include about 100 consortium members total uh, initially. During that process is what we call a two-token system, kind of like the MakerDAO's uh, Maker and DAI and other two-token systems in the crypto industry. So there'll be a governance token called the Libra Investment Token, which the consortium members are allowed for participation in governance of the network. And the value of this token uh, stems from the value of partaking this governance and potentially any other reward or revenues paid to the network maintainers. And this is decoupled from the day-to-day value of the payment token, which is the Libra token. And then the value of this governance token relies on the longevity and utility value of the payment token offered to the consortium. And also at the same time, there's a $10 million minimum in terms of uh, from participants. But uh, what's actually really significant that we noticed as part of the consortium, because you see a lot of bigger names like MasterCard, Visa, um, e-commerce sites, etc. But they actually have three major social impact organizations, Kiva, Mercy Corps, and Women's uh, World Banking. Uh, have announced participation. And then Libra lowered the barrier of entry for these because uh, they don't have to pay the uh, the $10 million fees. It's actually really, really interesting because for non-impact entities, right, the regular commercial entities, it's yet to be determined if there's going to be more. Because right now there's only 100 validators, right? And they've already have about 30. So there's only about 70, 70 left. So the potential for them to increase that number is quite important. So that's sort of the, the infrastructure behind it. The next, we want to talk about impact. How is this going to impact our industry, right? The blockchain industry, you know, how is that going to impact Binance? First of all, Libra is testing its network. The mainnet is looking at 2020. So right now, obviously, there's a live sandbox that is going on. So that will enable third-party developers and any existing institutions to experiment writing contracts and get to familiar with the blockchain. What will be really, really interesting is basically how it's going to work into everyday apps, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook Messenger, especially with the Calibra interface, which looks really sleek. That's the connection, uh, the Calibra wallet that goes back into Facebook. So you have this organization, a consortium, that's a foundation that manages the Libra network that runs on the Libra blockchain with Libra tokens that's backed by a basket of currencies. But the actual use case that the user sees is the Calibra wallet. And that is going to be integrated within the Facebook ecosystem. And so from a, just a pure number of people impact perspective, immediately that is going to be tremendous, right? For Facebook, obviously, some of the um, impact are pretty obvious. This gets them into the digital payment space. 
number one. Number two, as a result, it gets them into the commerce space. At the same time, it may even get them into sort of like mobile app development space, which is currently being dominated by Apple, uh, commerce dominated by Amazon. I think all of these things are extremely uh, important because the Calibra wallet is something that is core to the Facebook ecosystem. But I think outside of Facebook, what we're interested in or what I'm more interested in is actually how is this impacting the crypto world? Currently, the cryptocurrency world, despite its sort of aggregate market cap of about $280 billion today, still faces challenges in terms of global adoption. And I think the Libra ecosystem is very, very uniquely positioned to broaden the reach and impact of the crypto world. First of all, this is a new on-ramp option into cryptocurrency. Right now, there's still a lot of frictions for fiat to access into cryptocurrency. First of all, if you look at it right now, the only way to, to on-ramp into crypto is that you have to buy it with fiat. And anything with size, you have to go through maybe even the traditional fiat exchanges. For Binance, we want to lower that threshold. That's why we've been working to build fiat exchanges in different jurisdictions around the world. But in the Libra world, in the initial onboarding into cryptocurrency and digital assets in general, it's actually made possible without ever touching fiat. For example, eBay, which is one of the uh, merchants that's part of the consortium, or Mercado Libre, right, which is a large e-commerce site in, in Latin America, they could help spread Libra into wallets of millions of individuals simply by allowing them to sell their services or items or goods directly for our cryptocurrency. So one of the Binance's uh, Launchpad project, BitTorrent, has a similar ecosystem. It allows individuals with internet activity to provide resources to earn crypto. So that swap between a physical or real resource for digital value act as an atomic swap. And uh, this network effect of allowing participating parties to achieve even better value proposition is tremendous. Second of all is trading, additional trading opportunities. Because right now, a lot of the trading are done with stablecoin to Bitcoin. But here, Libra is traded against other major cryptocurrencies, creating uh, trading opportunities the Libra could become the, an additional base currency. So that will attract many, many more institutional investors to basically trade it. It's going to lead to increased trading volumes and liquidity for cryptocurrency because Libra could act then as a, another major you know, denominated base currency. Third one is this is going to lead to more stablecoin issuance. I think we've talked a little bit of time about what stablecoins are. Stablecoins are basically where a single fiat currency sits at a, uh, a custodian partner and then issued a token of similar value is issued. But what we're seeing here is that this is cross-jurisdictional and cross-currency. What's really, really cool is that actually one of the bigger consequences is that um, Libra is actually setting the standard with its level of transparency and the ease of on-ramping. So it's actually become maybe an even easier option to on-ramp into cryptocurrency. So this competition that it creates amongst existing stable users and future stablecoin issuers is going to be tremendous because this is a validation of stablecoins in general. And more importantly, I think um, in the medium term is basically mass digital asset adoption. What that means is that there's going to be potential for many, many more pairs to be traded on exchanges because Libra token in itself with the sort of the Calibra wallet that's going to be embedded in Facebook's user base is going to drive crypto adoption at a whole new level. In the long term, some of the things that we've seen and some of the things that Libra even talked about themselves is basically providing uh, financial access. So obviously reshaping the payment world, increasing offering of uh, financial services, advancing a greater freedom of money and lowering capital restriction, and then also undollarizing. It actually introduces a new unit of account for global trade or what we call the undollarization of the world. So all of that, these are major financial impacts. Instead of going forward, instead of raising capital in dollars or euros or yen in a single jurisdiction, now you can raise in this new unit called Libra cross-jurisdictionally amongst 2.53 billion people. And also, if you look at cross-border payments, cross-border settlements, this could become a very important bridge. But that being said, there has already been a lot of challenges that have already come up from day one. Pretty aggressive feedback. Like one of the most important ones, I think, is regulatory. Is this going to be allowed? Given that it involves the movement of money cross-border, how is Facebook going to resolve that? Right? How can they do it better than the existing banks, which have been fined billions and billions of dollars for money laundering issues? I think this actually could solve that problem because uh, Facebook knows who you are, right? <laughs> From the data they have about you, they have a pretty good idea of who you are, where you live, what you do. 
based on all the pictures you've posted on their networks, the chats you've sent, and the profiles you've set up, and the friends you have, and the relationships you have. They pretty much have a social map or a social graph of everyone in the world, or everyone within their system. So from an identity perspective, Facebook knows more about you through their network than any bank will ever have because it's both cross-jurisdictional and it's constant and it's upgraded because they get real-time information about who is using it. So I think this is much bigger data that they have and I think that's critical. Other than money laundering concerns, essentially Facebook is printing its own currency. It's acting like a central bank in this situation or Libra is. That's where the bigger challenge is going to come in. It is impeding on the authority of the central banks. That is something that, to be determined. And the third piece of the equation is actually data privacy. And that concern is something that Facebook itself is dealing with. Not only do they know who you are and they store your data, now they know how much money you have. How does network and balance that? Yes, in the network itself, they don't know who you are, but through the wallets, you have to know who you are to meet its AML requirements. But where is that data stored, right? If that, is that data stored on a centralized database within Facebook? Then the privacy concerns that have been plaguing Facebook will continue to plague them. Do you trust Facebook with more data? That's the bigger challenge. And that challenge comes from user side. But that being said, users haven't stopped using Facebook because some of these privacy concerns have come up because they do offer a superior product. So in conclusion, I like to say a couple of things. One is uh, this initiative, the Libra cryptocurrency, will have significant impact for the global financial industry uh, as well as for the blockchain industry. The magnitude of its success will vary greatly on how Libra can convince regulators and financial institutions to collaborate with the consortium. Because if you noticed, there is no financial institution that's a part of the consortium right now. And that's due to financial institutions are generally more risk averse. And Facebook, this blockchain is actually attacking their previous business model, to be honest. Outside of regulatory concerns and financial institutions uh, wanting to collaborate with the consortium, uh, some of the other factors we have to consider is the ability of, to scale the Libra user base to build a trusted alliance, uh, number one. Because at the end of the day, these assets will have to sit in a financial institution for custody. They can't get away from that. How can they scale that if the asset size get really, really big on a global basis? And secondly is actually public trust, uh, institution trust from government organizations, uh, from users. That's really important. Whether or not this turns out to be one of the largest successes in the industry, I think Libra is going to contribute greatly to bridge the gap um, between the right to access basic financial services and the digitally connected individuals that remain unbanked across the world. And despite all of these uncertainties around it and some of the questions I've laid out, Libra has already laid out an extensive and well thought out groundwork for blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies to be adopted by traditional businesses and individuals. Thank you for listening and I hope you join us again next time.